There were three military installations in Kansas during the First World War, Camp Funston, Fort Riley, and Fort Leavenworth. When the war was over, 110 Kansans had received the Distinguished Service Cross and two had received the Congressional Medal of Honor. The war was over, Billy, and times were good. The farmers of the state were investing their profits in power machinery to make their jobs easier. But the boom was temporary and farmers had to pay heavily after the stock market crash of 29. And then, dust storms from the drought of 32 whipped across western Kansas. By 1935, the storms were so bad that many farmers were forced to leave the area, which is now part of the Sixth State Dust Bowl. A lesson was learned from the tragedy. The remaining farmers looked to conservation to prevent a similar disaster. Governor Alf Landon and the constructive legislature of 1933 helped Kansas to, to its feet after the Depression. The next year, Landon was the only Republican governor re-elected in the country. In 1936, Landon was the Republican presidential nominee. He lost to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The news of Pearl Harbor swiftly brought a telegram to FDR saying that Kansas was ready to serve. Fort Riley was expanded to train mechanized troops, while draftees were being processed at Fort Leavenworth. Eighteen Army and Navy air centers were scattered over the state. A major contribution of Kansas to the war effort was the building of airplanes. Factories in Wichita and Kansas City manufactured nearly 30,000 planes for World War II. And during the war, over 4,500 Kansans died in service. The German surrender was accepted by General Dwight Eisenhower as Supreme Commander of the Allied Armies in Europe. Eisenhower grew up in Kansas, you remember that, Billy. He played baseball for Abilene High School before entering West Point in 1911. I'm sure he didn't realize that half a century later, he would be retiring from the highest office in the land. President Dwight Eisenhower returned to Abilene in the fall of 1959 for groundbreaking ceremonies of the Eisenhower Presidential Library. He asked Kansans, but does anyone of central Kansas need to be told that our parents and grandparents who first worked this black soil were not faint-hearted? They had faith. Faith in the re religious concepts that dominated their beings. Faith in the virtue and success of their own labor. Faith in their neighbors and in the inexhaustible potential of free men. If they were here today, they would, I'm sure, wonder whether we possess, for our time, as they did for theirs, a comprehension of the concepts and basic principles which, universally applied, can lead mankind toward a world community of free nations characterized by peace, by peace and by justice. Our forefathers who pioneered this land were concerned initially with individual family welfare. Soon, however, they developed allegiance to larger communities, the state and nation. And in doing so, they did not diminish their devotion to family or local community. Indeed, they strengthened it. If they saw the world as it is today, they would be the first to realize that peoples everywhere must now achieve an allegiance to the wider free world community and doing so they will be thereby strengthen make more meaningful their devotion to family to state and nation the name of eisenhower is another to take its place in the colorful 
and sometimes rugged story of Kansas. Well, goodbye, Billy. The state has come a long way from her six-gun days. What Billy has seen are only a few pictures of the faces and the events which have left lasting impressions on the first 100 years of Kansas statehood. Often at night, when the heavens are bright, with the light of the glittering stars, have I stood here amazed, and asked as I gazed, if their glory exceeds this of ours. Home, home on the range, where the deer and the antelope play, where seldom is heard a discussion 